afternoon, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Afternoon. We will be starting now. Today's talk is Trademarks and Intellectual Property pr Protection. Trademarks and Intellectual Property Protection, yes. Uh, sorry for the slight delay. There was an issue with um, technology as usual. <laughs> anyway, um, before we start the talk proper, uh, we would like to share with you a video from the firm. I founded the firm in September 1985 with the vision of seeking truth and justice for our clients and not just winning their cases. Over the years, the team has achieved many significant milestones. We are today recognized by the Legal 500, Asia Law Profiles and Asian Legal Business as a recommended firm in various practice areas. While we have embraced technology to make our services efficient and responsive, we continue to grow on a bedrock of meticulous preparation and hard work, for which there is really no substitute. As legal practice becomes increasingly international, we keep ourselves ahead of the curve with our relationship with lawyers from around the world. Our firm is a founding member of the Legal Lawyers, a growing international network of law firms in 20 Asian and European countries. We believe in partnering with our clients to protect and grow their business. We achieve this by holding firm to our values of integrity and justice while giving our best to deliver effective and efficient solutions. Instead of just legal services, we focus on developing great working relationships based on understanding and respect. The firm invests in its team and emphasizes professional development. We are keen to share our knowledge and publish our articles on our website. And we also give back with our corporate social responsibility activities. We cultivate a passion for the law and enjoy what we do. This brings out the best in us for our clients today and tomorrow. We regularly advise foreign clients, including many Chinese investors, and have a ready appreciation for different ways of doing business. In corporate matters, we offer relevant and commercial solutions, often raising issues that clients may or may not have realized before. In negotiations, we believe in facilitating win-win outcomes. Welcome again, everyone. This is once again, Trademarks and Intellectual Property Protection. Uh, my name is Hannah, and I'm one of the senior associates with the firm, and I'll be your moderator for today. Before we start, I'd like to introduce the firm and what we do. We are a mid-sized firm founded in 1985 by Dr. Ma Wenguai. Today, we are a firm of 22 people, 22 lawyers, sorry, and 19 people in the supporting team. Dato Ma is now our consultant following his retirement from the Court of Appeal in 2015. We work primarily with SMEs, family businesses. We have four different departments in the firm, namely the Corporate Department, the Dispute Resolution Department, a dedicated team for employment, and another one for individuals and families. We have five focus groups, which are also called practice groups. We focus on the ASEAN and China uh, region. We do construction, we do FDIs, real estate, sports and esports, of which our speaker here today, Leslie, is quite an expert in. Today's talk is really to share knowledge and raise awareness and to encourage networking together with our client and potential clients. Um, this, we recently had a talk uh, on AMLA and we will be having an upcoming talk. Okay, so before I continue, let me just remind you that today's talk does not constitute legal advice. If you require specific advice, uh, please do consult us, come, for, come to us for a uh, proper legal consultation and details will be shared at the end of the talk. Today, we have a very illustrious speaker. She is the partner of the firm uh, in the media, entertainment and sports as well as technology and esports. She's experienced in general civil litigation matters. 
drafting of corporate and commercial agreements and sports law. Now, she was nominated this year, actually, uh, as the Women Lawyer of the Year in the ALB Malaysian Law Awards. And one really interesting fact is that she's captained the first national women's dragon boat team to the 2018 Asian Games and the 2019 Sea Games. If you have questions, please uh, access our Slido. You can do so by scanning the QR code or visiting the website there and entering the code 88569. We will be addressing the questions at the end of the talk. I'm just gonna leave this slide here for a while so that you can scan the QR code. Otherwise, you can just you know, Google um, this website and then enter the code 88569. All right, I think we are all ready. Um, Leslie, take it away. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Um, thank you, Hannah, for the very, very kind introduction. Thank you, thank you, Dato, I see, I see your thumbs up. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Leslie, uh, as introduced by uh, Hannah earlier. I see a couple of uh, familiar names uh, in the uh, audience, in the participants list. And uh, I just wanna thank you for taking the time to spend your afternoon with us, whether you're at home or uh, in the office. And I will try my best to wrap this up by about four o'clock or so uh, for both the presentation as well as the Q&A. Um, I'll just get my slides shared. All right. So, so for today, um, the topic is trademarks and intellectual property protection. And I have basically four main talking points. The first one, um, which I'll probably spend just about uh, 10 to 15 minutes or so, is targeted to uh, share with everyone an overview of the intellectual property protection uh, in Malaysia, uh, which is also applies internationally, and I'll show you why later. Uh, this part is a little bit theoretical, so just bear with me as I go through um, the slides to be a little bit more wordy. And then for the second, third, and fourth point, we'll delve into trademark itself a little bit more, uh, hoping to give you a little bit more practical aspects, as well as to hopefully convince you uh, on the advantages and the importance of registering a trademark. Okay, so in, in typical lawyer fashion, uh, I'm going to start with a disclaimer. Um, there are a couple of uh, uh, pictures and images in my slides. Uh, uh, please take note that they are purely for illustration purposes. Um, and generally, um, the photos are obtained from unsplash.com. So it's a photo site which provides royalty-free images. So here's where I'm going to give a tip. So very often, and uh, one of the sort of issues that we have when our clients come to us is um, they get notices of demand from a third party claiming that uh, the photos have been used unlawfully without the proper consent from the owner. And then the client comes to us and say, oh, you know, I got this photo from Google. Okay. Google doesn't give you the permission to use all the photos that are available on its search button. So what you would, um, if you need to use some photos, whether it's for presentation uh, or whatnot, uh, there are many, many websites out there that provide royalty-free images, which means you don't have to pay to use those images. Um, and it differs. Some might require you to give um, a credit to the original owner, uh, but at the base of it, you don't have to pay any royalty for it. So that's a tip uh, to start off. Uh, and of course, the usual disclaimer, uh, we're not trying to uh, claim any ownership or rights over the images and attribute it purely to the original copyright owner. And what you'll see is at the bottom of my slides, where applicable, I've quoted the relevant sources. Um, there are also some uh, information and definition that might be familiar, especially, uh, I know I have some friends here that are from the legal industry itself. Uh, please uh, know that I've taken those definitions from uh, WIPO or MIPO. I explain who these two parties are. Um, basically, they're the governing body for intellectual property here uh, in Malaysia and also internationally. Okay, so this to start off with, let's go on to overview of intellectual property. So um, not everybody knows what intellectual property is. Uh, we commonly refer to it as IP. Okay? Basically, when we talk about IP, we're referring to inventions and creations, obviously, that comes from the human mind. Okay? We want to uh, encourage uh, people to be creative, but those creations and those inventions need to be protected. And in law, 
they are basically protected by intellectual property, IP. So IP is really important and, and what a lot of people don't realize is that IP is, can be of value and I'll, and I'll elaborate a bit more of this in my last point when I talk about uh, advantages and importance of registration. It's intangible, you can't see it, but it is an asset. It can be a very valuable asset for your company, even though uh, it's not something that you can, um, you know, see like a, a building that your company would buy. It's intangible but valuable nonetheless. Okay, so uh, WIPO stands for the World Intellectual Property Organization. They are the governing body. Um, some brief details about them: they are a self-funding agency under the United Nations. They have 193 member states, including Malaysia, um, and their main mission is to lead the development of a balanced, effective international IP system across the world, okay? So basically the whole IP system uh, across our, our, our nation, our world, uh, is governed under WIPO. And then in Malaysia, the body that you need to be uh, aware of when it comes to IP is this body called MIPO, okay? Also known as the Intellectual Property Corporation of Malaysia. Um, my slides has the brief details of its history. I won't go into too much details, uh, but it's basically a, a, a formerly a government agency, uh, and then subsequently in 2003 was uh, corporatized, uh, and then 2005 rebranded to MIPO. Okay, so when we talk about IP protection, uh, whether it's under WIPO or MIPO, these are the six main IP that is known throughout the world. Okay, so as you can see, trademark, um, copyright, patent, industrial designs, trade secrets, and geographical indications. So I'm gonna go through very briefly what each of those entail. So trademark, um, long story short, a lot of words on the slide. I'll make this very simple. It's basically a sign that enables uh, a customer or another person to distinguish your product, your goods, your services from the products, goods, and services of another party. Okay, very simple. Have a look at all the logos that you see on the slide. I'm sure they're very familiar to all of you. And... For your own reasons, you would choose a BMW over a Mercedes. For your own reasons, you would choose Starbucks over Coffee Bean. For your own reasons, you would choose Apple over Android. Okay, and these are brands that have grown um, their value and their brand towards you, us as consumers over the years. Okay, um, I'm just going to go back to my previous slide. The third point is really, really important. Okay, um, trademarks and, and IP in general, they're all territorial and jurisdictional in nature which means if you get a protection in one country, you don't get an automatic protection in other countries. Okay, I'm gonna elaborate more on this point later as well. So um, the acts that govern trademark in Malaysia, we have the old 97 act, and this act, um, the old act is applicable to all trademarks that were filed before 27 December last year. And then very, very recently, uh, just uh, 10 months ago, 11 months ago, uh, we had, the new Trademarks Act 2019 enforced uh, here in Malaysia, when, which is applicable uh, to all trademark applications moving forward from December onwards. Okay, and why this new Trademark uh, Act is really important is because it contains one specific provision about the Madrid system. Okay, again, I'll elaborate more on the Madrid system later on and why it's uh, very beneficial to especially SME companies. And the other thing that's uh, important to note in the new act is that um, now when you want to trademark uh, something, a sign, it even includes shape of goods. Uh, I put that in bold in my slides. It can include their packaging, color, sound, scent, hologram, positioning, sequence of motion, or even a combination of all of this. So the, the, trademark, the new Trademarks Act has basically taken into account um, uh, how people might want to, or companies might want to uh, create a certain mark for themselves. And it may not be just in a form of a graphic sign, which is the traditional method, but it may even involve things like shapes, hologram, sounds, etc. Okay. And then uh, it's also supported by the Trademark Regulations 97 in Malaysia. Okay. So trademarks, if you register it, it um, uh, confers a, oh, sorry, this is my copyright slide. Oh, no. my slide is just being blocked. Okay, so moving on to copyright. Okay, so in copyright, usually it's applicable to um, things like um, 
uh, literary works, artistic works, especially for uh, songs. That's something that's very commonly known for, as well as broadcast. So um, authors, performers, etc. Okay, for for a party to get copyright protection, your work has to be original, and it must be reduced into material form. So you can't say I've created a song in my head and I should get protection over it because it stays in my head. Okay, steps must be taken to reduce it into material form. Put it down in writing, whether it's music notes, write down the lyrics, uh, etc. And the uh, Act in Malaysia is the Copyright Act 1987. Okay, so copyright is really um, uh, unique in the sense that actually copyright uh, protection is automatically granted upon creation. But uh, MIPO has created a system where you can actually submit a copyright voluntary notification. Basically, you submit a form into the system to say that I've created this song, I've, I've, I've created this broadcast, I've created this uh, a piece of work, and it belongs to me, created on this date, etc. Okay, so there's a small fee involved for the notification. Alternatively, um, what uh, uh, another form of uh, or another manner in which you can try and protect your work if you're an author, you can actually um, you've reduced your work into a material form. So you put it into a thumb drive. You put your thumb drive into an envelope, seal it, and post it to yourself. Don't open the envelope when you receive it because on the envelope there will be the date on which you posted, and that envelope will then be proof of the creation of your work basically. So those are some ways you can protect your copyright. Okay, so copyright protection is generally for 50 years for different uh, works. It, the dates start from whether the day you perform your uh, uh, sound recording. In terms of uh, literary, musical, or artistic works, it's actually the life of the author plus 50 years of his death. But in general, as you can see, we are looking at uh, 50 years almost across the board. Okay, so why is, uh, it, why is it important to protect your copyright? It gives the owner exclusive right to control your work. You can claim originality. Of course, if you put so much you know, effort into creating something that's original, of course, you want to be able to say, I'm the author of it. Okay? Um, it gives you a legal right if someone attempts to um, use your work uh, without your permission. Okay? You can then um, uh, take action against them. And more importantly, you put, again, you put all the effort into creating something original. You might want to uh, license it out or give it to another third party and earn money from it, get financial gains from it, basically. Okay, so uh, in Malaysia, we have three main copyright licensing bodies. Okay, uh, so if, if the category of composers, lyricists, or publicists, the relevant body would be uh, the music authors, copyright protection, Berhad. Okay, this deals with uh, the license to users of music. Okay, and then subsequently they will pay the songwriter when their works are broadcast. So you probably see this in uh, maybe uh, pubs or uh, even uh, clubs when you go to Zook uh, and they are playing. Technically, they are supposed to pay um, a, a licensing fee for that. So music music recordings are under PPM Public Performance Malaysia Senior Berhad. They issue licenses and also collect fees from commercial users. And then if performers, uh, they usually liaise with Recording Performance Malaysia Berhad. Okay. So these three, these three bodies have been around for a while. Uh, a couple of years back, what happened was they all decided to come under one umbrella called MRM, Music Rights Malaysia. But uh, of late, they've decided to disband that main umbrella and now they operate back as three separate bodies. Uh, so just a matter, a little bit of history there. Okay, so if you have an invention, okay, um, you can go for patent protection. Okay. But under our Patents Act, there is also a mention of utility innovation. Okay, so what's the difference between the two? Uh, MIPO has very, I took this from their Facebook page. They've very kindly shown uh, what's the difference between patent and utility innovation. So you've created something new, okay, which is a pen. And then subsequently after that, you've taken steps to do um, uh, incremental uh, improvements or adaptions to that pen. As you can see, the pen on the right is slightly nicer. Um, well, yeah, looks nicer, shinier, et cetera, probably can write smoother, okay? So for that, you apply for utility innovation, okay? So if uh, you want to register your invention, uh, some of the main requirements, it must be new, it must involve an inventive step, and it must be industrially applicable. Relevant acts, patent act, uh, patent regulations, but take note, uh, you can't patent things that 
uh, relate to this list. Um, discovery, scientific, mathematical methods, uh, plans, uh, schemes, rules or methods of doing business, um, anything related to treatment of the human body. Um, and if you are successful in obtaining patent protection, you're looking at 20 years, uh, utility innovation in 10 years. And say if you created something not on your own, that's a group of you, uh, you can apply as joint owners. Um, again, some basic rights. Uh, if you've applied for patent protection, you can then exploit it. And exploit has a bit of a negative connotation to it. Uh, but in this instance, the Act has actually explained or defined what is exploitation. Uh, you can uh, make, import, sell the product. You can stock it uh, and then uh, see whatever is involved in the process of it. And basically, license it out or make it industrially applicable uh, for for the bigger community, so to speak. Okay, uh, but I think what's important to know, I didn't, I didn't place it here, is that um, the act actually says that if you apply for a patent protection, you can't simultaneously apply for utility innovation. So it's one or the other, depending on what stage you are at in terms of the creation of your invention. Okay, so this is just one example I wanted to give. Um, uh, so a friend of mine uh, and I, we both bought, uh, this is a foam roller, um, so, so we at least we use this quite a fair bit to try and uh, roll out our aching muscles. Okay, so we bought this foam roller, and uh, both our foam rollers were different. Okay, so this first row foam roller, mine, had the word patent pending. If you see at the bottom left of, of the of the right image, at the bottom left, there's the word patent pending, and the one my friend bought actually had the patent number uh, attached to it. So. Um, this was one of the things that got me reading uh, a lot more about patent, actually, because when I saw this in my foam roller, I, I started, you know, just, just trying to find out more about patent protection uh, in Malaysia. All right, next one, industrial design. So when we talk about industrial design, we're talking about features of shape, configuration, pattern, uh, related or applied to an article by industrial process whereby the finished article appeals to the eyes and are judged by the eyes. So it's something very, very visual. Um, and in order to um, apply for industrial design protection, you need to fulfill the interpretation as in the act. It must be new in Malaysia or elsewhere, means it's not disclosed to the public before. And of course, it cannot be uh, contrary to public order or morality. So the list for non-industrial design is, uh, it cannot be a method or principle of construction, uh, the features cannot relate purely to its function or is dependent to another part of the article. Okay. And then again, uh, as you can see, you, you start to see a pattern here. If you are registered industrial design, what it gives you an exclusive right to uh, make import hire for sale, uh, for trade, for business, again, for commercial and financial gain. Protection five years, you can extend it uh, four more terms of five years each. So that's another 20 years relevant act. Industrial Design Act and the regulations. Okay, um, geographical indication. Okay, uh, this is where you want to um, sort of apply for protection, where your product relates to the quality, reputation, or characteristic of a certain place. Okay, um, I'm, I'm going to give one example, which everybody is going to know: Sarawak pepper. Okay, so Sarawak pepper is is, is one example. Uh, and usually when you apply for geographical indication, you usually include the uh, name of the place of origin of the goods. Okay, uh, so this is Weipo's, uh definition of geographical indication. Um, okay, so right of use. Um, you can then basically, um, what will happen is if you apply for geographical indication, and then when you sell your product, you're basically representing to the public that your product is related to this place and is of this standard, this characteristic, and is originating from there, basically, okay? But something very, very important to note, okay? Even if you create this product and you apply for geographical indication, this does not stop another party from making the same products using the same techniques. So long as they achieve that same standards that's been set in the uh, register, they can actually use uh, the same, they can, someone else can call their products around uh, Sarawak pepper as well, okay? As long as they can, you know, find a way to cook the pepper and that's just that standard, 
they can get the geographical indication protection as well. Okay. So usually uh, GI is applied for agricultural products, natural products, uh, uh, handicraft or industry products. Uh, and as you can see, uh, you can't protect things like um, if it's contrary to moral order uh, or if it's no longer being protected in the country of origin or no longer in use in the country of origin. So I've heard that sometimes uh, wines are also, uh, you know, in overseas in Europe, sometimes they use GI protection as well. Okay, so certain parties who can apply for this protection, if you're either a producer, you're an authority or you're a trade uh, organization or association, protection 10 years, renewal 10 years. And because I think you're a little tired of hearing my voice, I'm gonna play a 50 second video by WIPO, uh, whereby they explain trade secrets quite well. Okay, great. Sarah, can you- Ever wondered what goes into Coca-Cola's secret recipe or Google's algorithm? Well, you'll probably never know because these are trade secrets. Companies of every size use trade secrets to get a competitive edge and protect their intellectual assets, industrial processes, strategic plans, customer data, and so on. Does that mean the fajitas recipe at your mother's restaurant qualifies for protection as a trade secret? Well, maybe, but she would have to take appropriate steps to keep it secret. Trade secrets are not limited in time, have no registration cost, and are effective immediately. But unlike patents, they may be used by others if discovered and are more difficult to enforce. All right, great. So um, unlike the other five IP protection that I've uh, spoken about earlier, you notice that I've always quoted the relevant uh, act in Malaysia that protects that particular IP. Uh, for trade secrets, there is no such act uh, in Malaysia, okay? So usually trade secrets are treated as confidential information, which can be protected. It can even be sold. It can even be licensed. And what amounts to a trade secret or a confidential information? You'll see the words I've bold in the middle of my slides for your ease. Okay, they must be commercially valuable because they are secret. Okay, it must be only limited to a group of people and the uh, owner must have taken steps to try and keep it secret, okay? So usually when we talk about trade secrets or confidential information, we're talking about things like uh, processes, uh, data. It can even be your list of clients, you know, like just now the video was talking about uh, Google's algorithm or Facebook's algorithm uh, and how the, you know, every time you shop for something, the advertisement keeps appearing on your uh, uh, Facebook. You don't know how that happens, neither do I. Um, advertising strategies, okay? Or it can even be a combination of all of this. So trade secrets need to be kept secret, but how do you protect them? Okay. So there are a couple of ways. First, you can either insert confidentiality clauses. Um, I think if uh, all of you, if you're an employee and you go have a look at your employment contract, chances are there is a confidentiality clause in there. Okay. So sometimes parties are made to sign non-disclosure agreements. Um, this is not uncommon. Sometimes before parties even start um, um, uh, negotiations or discussions. Sorry, excuse me, I'm just gonna sneeze. Before they start negotiations and discussions, um, they uh, make uh, each other sign non-disclosure agreements so that whatever is discussed, you know, it, it can't be disclosed to external third parties, okay? You can even protect your trade secrets through physical barriers or security systems, okay? So when we talk about trade secrets, the one product that will always come to mind is Coca-Cola. Everybody always wonders, what is Coca-Cola's formula? What makes Coca-Cola so good? Um, and there's a joke that it was well, not really a joke, but there's a saying that Coca-Cola's formula is the world's best kept secret. And apparently it's kept uh, in a vault. Uh, some say the vault is in uh, Coca-Cola's HQ, headquarters in Atlanta. Some say it was in a vault in the bank. Uh, but a couple of years ago, they actually shifted it to World of Coca-Cola. Uh, they've, they've built a museum. Uh, and apparently they've put the formula in there for to share with everybody. 125 year old formula, they've shared it uh, with everybody. Um, but apparently it's because they have actually improved on that original formula so much that they don't mind sharing that, that formula anymore. Okay, but what's important to note, you, you might have taken all these steps to protect your trade secret. Okay, but if 
uh, say your, you have a trade secret, okay, say you have a list of clients, okay, and that is your company's trade secrets. You can't stop uh, your competitor or another company from using their own methods and compiling, so happen, using their own methods, they happen to compile the very same list, okay? You can't stop them. Or they may even, uh, for the more technical points, uh, just now we mentioned there may be some technical processes and all. Um, if they do reverse engineering, means they see your end product, okay? Like when Apple first launched the iPhone, uh, all the other phone companies wanted to figure out how to do a, a touchscreen phone. So they took the final product, they tried to tear it apart and then they reverse engineer and then tried to recreate their own, um, they tried to recreate their own uh, touchscreen phone as well. So that's what we call uh, reverse engineering, okay? Um, so this is an example that WIPO has given. So say if you have a website, okay, if you have a website, the left-hand side shows how you can use different IP protection, how you can use patent, copyright, trademark, industrial design, and trade secrets to protect all the different aspects of your website. See the software, the database, uh, the logo, the business name, uh, trade secrets can even protect your graphic symbols. Okay, so 337, we're good for time. Okay, um, I generally like my talks to be interactive, but we are quite limited by um, the virtual platform. Nonetheless, what I like to do is, I'm gonna assume that all of you have been paying very close attention the last uh, 20 minutes to everything that I've been saying, okay? And for a very brief moment, I want you to imagine that you are an employee of Coca-Cola. See the beautiful bottle there, makes us all very thirsty on this hot afternoon. And your boss comes to you and you say, we have this new product, our company. We need to protect this, okay? Based on everything that you've heard the last 20 minutes, I'd like you to think of how you can protect this product. What are the IP protections that you can use? And which aspect of this bottle that you would present to your boss for protection? Oh, wow, Sarah, you have a Coca-Cola bottle on your table. Fantastic. I chose the right product, okay? Right, so if you notice um, you, at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen, there's a chat button. I'd like you to click on that and I want you to share your answer. Just click, okay, specify. Oh, wow, I've got answers already, great. Keep them coming, okay. Um, which aspect of the bottle you will want to protect, you know, you're gonna present to your boss to protect and which IP protection you would use to protect this product. Okay, remember you're an employee of Coca-Cola, okay? Work in the best interest of your company. Great, I think uh, Shahab says Peyton the design, Elliot says the logo. Okay, design. Hope I'm gonna receive a few more answers. Great, IP of the ingredient, okay. Uh, David, great, which IP protection would you use to protect the ingredient? Dr. Amy, thank you, color of the logo. Shape of the bottle, Palin, thanks. Palin, what would you use to protect the shape of the bottle? Sarah, logo embossed. Intan, get up. I'm not very sure what you mean by get up. Okay, Umu, industrial design for the bottle design. Oh gosh, she's very detailed. Okay, Umu, thank you. She says for the bottle design, she will use industrial design. For the logo, she will use trademark. For the drink recipe, she will use trade secret. David, trade secret. To protect, uh, get up. Oh, Sarah, get up is the look. Uh, maybe, maybe she means the look. Uh, Dr. Amy says taste, the look. Okay, good, good. Trademark, trade secrets. Okay, I'm just gonna let this run for another uh, ten more seconds or so, guys. Anybody else is dying to protect this Coca-Cola bottle? Be the best employee your boss will love. Okay. Oh. Just ask my lawyer. Thanks, Ricky. I hope your lawyer is Marwin Kwan and Associates. Do give me a call. Looking forward to it. Okay, great. So thank you everyone for your answer. Okay, I hope uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed that exercise. Uh, it gives us a chance to type on the keyboard a little bit. So one product like this, you can have multiple protection. Okay, then this is something that a lot of people are actually not very aware. They think that if they want to protect a product, they only can use one form of IP protection. So I wanted to use this example to illustrate that from all the six IP protection that we've, we've spoken about earlier, and for one product, you can already trademark the brand. Okay, you can copyright uh, the packaging art, okay, the trademark, uh, sorry, trade secret. 
uh, for the formula. Uh, you can use, previously we probably would have used industrial design for the shape of the bottle. But if you remember earlier, I mentioned about the new Trademarks Act now covers shapes uh, as well. So those are, those are some of the protection that you could use uh, to present to your boss at Coca-Cola. Okay. okay, I'm going to move on and delve in straight to, to trademark itself uh, uh, for now. Okay. So when we talk about trademarks, uh, what exactly is registrable? Okay, and these are all plucked uh, from the Act. Uh, these are all plucked from the Act. You can trademark things like the name. Uh, you know, you can represent it in a specific, uh, special or particular manner. Okay, this is this is one of the most common. Uh, sometimes some people want to trademark their signature. Some people invent the word. Okay, um, something new, something distinctive, uh, and then uh, the main thing is to make your mark unique and distinctive. Because if you remember, we go back to the original definition of uh, trademark. It must be a sign that's graphically able to distinguish your product from someone else's product or your services from someone else's services. So you need to make it unique uh, and distinguished. So that's the list of what is registrable. Uh, and the list of what is non-registrable is much longer. Okay, And why it's much longer is because when you look at the list of what's registrable, the options are endless. It is fully dependent on uh, your company's uh, direction, uh, you know, uh, you, you know, the, your product, your service, uh, the capability of your designer. You know, the, the options are really endless as long as you fulfill somewhere uh, within the requirements of the act. But what is non-registrable serves as a guideline for when you submit a trademark application, these are some of the potential grounds on which your trademark application might be rejected. Okay, And the most common one is actually the first one, that the mark is likely to deceive or cause confusion to the public. Okay? So say you create um, a rendang chicken burger, that you, you know, you're the next, you, you stay at home during CMCO and you decided you, you want to be the next uh, burger chef. Um, and you create a name that unfortunately sounds very similar to uh, KFC. Uh, you, maybe you call it uh, KBC or something like that. No, R RBC, Rendang Chicken Burger, RCB, Rendang Chicken Burger, okay, RCB. Okay, so maybe um, the mark is likely to cause confusion in the eyes of the public. So MIPO might actually uh, either ask you to consider amending your application or might even reject uh, your application. Okay, uh, some standard ones, the mark cannot contain anything scandalous, offensive, uh, prejudicial to security of uh, the nation. Uh, it's already well known uh, or registered in Malaysia for something uh, else. Okay, uh, it uh, consider, uh, consists of a uh, geographical indication, uh, but is not related to that territory that's being referred to. Uh, and then there's a brief mention about wines as well. Okay, so. Uh, if you apply for a trademark application, you're looking at a 10-year protection, and then subsequently, if you renew, it's a further 10 years. But do take note that, say, you pass through the whole uh, registration process, which I'm going to go through later. You go through the whole registration process, and you decide not to use the mark for um, three years. Okay? There is a possibility your registration might be revoked okay, for non-use. means you just register, and then you don't use it for three years, okay? So this is a form of protection um, because what we have is sometimes we have people who do squatting. So they, they know that this name or this, uh, uh, this name or this mark might get popular in the near future. So they go to the office and trademark it first. And then suddenly the original company which has been developing the product, you know, suddenly decide they want to trademark, but they found that this party has already uh, taken their name. So what can they do? The only thing they can do is try and buy over the mark from, from the person who has already registered. And then this guy then gets to earn uh, money blindly, so to speak. Okay, but um, so this is to prevent that. You must be a bona fide uh, proprietor when you register a mark and you must use it uh, within a three year term. Okay, so insofar as the process is concerned, um, it's always good to start with a conceptualization process. I, I have some friends here who, who work in the, I think, um, agencies, they do a lot of design work, okay? This is something that you might be helping your clients with. 
a client might come to you and say, I need, I need a brand, uh, I need a logo for my new company. Okay, of course, you're going to take into account what is the product, you know, what's the uh, uh, target audience, what's the direction of the company, uh, etc. Uh, some owners might be a little bit uh, picky, they might want, uh, you know, certain, they want a dragon inside, they want the, uh, some waves to show water and things like that. Okay, so it's very important to conceptualize. Some people, what they do is they just, they just um, uh, trademark just a name by itself. Just a name, uh, plain and simple, in almost typographical, maybe Times New Roman. Okay? The danger with that is that if you do that, no problem. You get protection, but your logo is no longer unique and distinctive. Remember, let's go back to basic elements. You want unique and distinctive. Okay? So in terms of color, um, when you register, you can uh, just register in, in, in black and white if you want. So when you register in black and white, then it can be deemed to be applicable uh, for all colors. There's no specific colors. Or if you're very specific, your corporate image or your, you know, your brand identity is such that you want it in a specific color, then in your registration process, you can specify that's only in this color. The danger with that is that chances are when you create a brand, you, you probably want to use it on different, you know, use a t-shirt, use on cup and, and different kind of things. Okay, so if you want the protection across the board, it's better to have um, no limitation as to color, so to speak. Okay, and so after you, you, you've gone through the whole conceptualization process, and then you want to register, and then how are you going to find out if there's someone who has registered something that's a similar mark? Okay, so um, there is an option to do a search. Uh, in, in my book, we regularly help our clients with this. You know, sometimes we even sit down with them on the conceptualization process. So we sit with them right from the get-go, uh, help them conduct the search and then only go through the, the registration process itself. And uh, I just uh, put uh, a, a sample here. So I just want to show you how McDonald's logo has basically evolved uh, throughout the years. Okay, as you can see since 1940. Okay, so this, they would have gone through their conceptualization process and grown their brand, grown their uh, concept over the years. And uh, I've gotten this from a McDonald's US website, okay? And it's actually a page that says that, uh, you know, if you're interested in using our logo, McDonald's logo for your next project, you can actually put in a request to them on their website, okay? So, I mean, they say that, look, we've spent 50 years developing the, the McDonald's trademark and logo. They are vital to... Uh, our brand quality, they are consistent with what our customers have come to know and trust. Uh, but we'll consider your application and you see towards the bottom, they ask you to tell, tell them about your request and then they consider it and, and, and get back to you basically. So this is a major brand that all of us know uh, and, and this is how they, they manage their trademarks basically. Okay, so when, we, uh, or when you're considering to uh, put in your trademark registration, okay, you need to identify which class that you want to register your trademark in, okay? And under the NIS agreement, there are 45 classes. Yeah, I've, I've listed a few here, okay? And my samples here is purely to uh, not show how many words that I can type, but it's actually to illustrate the number of industries that are available for registration. So uh, again, we usually sit down with our, with our clients, try and understand the nature of their business and try and guide them which class might be suitable for their registration. You can apply for multiple classes. Uh, you can apply for multiple classes. So say if, if, if I'm Nike, I might apply for class 25. You see on the far right there, clothing, footwear, headwear. But I might also want to apply for class 28, which is sporting articles as well. But of course, the more classes you apply for, the fees go a little bit higher for each every class that you add on. Okay, so just to show you pharmaceuticals on the left hand side, toiletries, class three. Um, you know, if you're in the food industry, 29, 30, uh, beers, uh, 32. Okay, very commonly what we see is clients applying for class 35. Okay, because they say that they only want to use their logo for advertising purposes. Okay. Um, you have insurance, 36, construction, telecommunications, and 41, even education as well. Okay. Right. So here's just a, a very brief overview of the trademark registration process. I realize it's 10 minutes to four. I'm going to try and wrap it up. I still got one last point to go. Um, so you start off by submitting the application. It can be done manually or online. There's now two options to it. So when MIPO receives it, they will do an examination. 
and to determine whether or not it fulfills the statutory requirement. So remember the list just now, we say what is non-registrable, those are the requirements that they will actually go through. And if they find that you know, you, you, you're contrary to one of those, they might give you a provisional refusal, or if it's all okay, they will then do a substantive examination. One more time, they will decide whether it's a provisional refusal, or if all is good, they will proceed to publish it in the uh, IP official journal. Okay, so there is this thing called opposition. So when your registration is published in the journal, it then becomes known to the public. Okay, it gets known to the public, and then uh, uh, a, a third party who might be an interested party or who might uh, want to stop you from registering that mark or logo might file an opposition proceedings to challenge your registration, to stop you from registering, okay? So say, um, for example, um, just now we were using uh, the KFC example, okay? So if you create this burger and it's very similar to one of KFC's burger, your mark, your logo, everything is similar to KFC. If KFC becomes aware of it, they might actually jump in and file these opposition proceedings, okay? And if all's good, you get your registration at the end. Uh, of the process, okay? All right, so this is something that is, is quite new in Malaysia. I mentioned earlier that the, um, the new Trademarks Act 2019 is, has an enabling provision for the Madrid system, okay? So you've set up a company, you have a brand, you have a service, well-known in Malaysia, okay? Naturally, you want to expand your brand uh, beyond Malaysia. You want to sell, you want to operate overseas. And uh, there are a couple of ways to do it. So because if you remember just now, I mentioned that trademarks are territorial and jurisdictional in nature. So if your company gets protection here in Malaysia, they don't get automatic protection in Thailand or Singapore uh, and the Philippines. So then what the company would then have to do is find a representative, uh, a version of Leslie in, in Thailand, okay, and get that, get that lawyer to then uh, go and sort out the registration for your mark in Thailand. Find another representative in Singapore and go and do it country by country. Okay, sounds sounds tedious and and you know long process. Um, in Europe, there's a regional route. Okay, so the regional route they're under the uh, EU IPO. So that's the Europe version of uh, our MIPO. Okay, they have a, a a sort of a convention where you can apply to a particular system and you get protection across Europe. Okay, but we don't have that in here in this region. Okay. The third option is to take an international route, okay? And the international route is basically this Madrid system. So here's our chicken rendang burger, okay, on the left-hand side, okay? So the first example I gave just now, as you see, you know, you want to expand to Australia, China, Japan, and Spain, and you have to go and apply four applications in all four countries, find four representatives, um, uh, file, pay four filing fees, uh, if there's a translation needed for Chinese, Japanese, and Spanish, you need to get three translations done. Okay, um, you need to file maybe a statutory declaration. You have to go and file more uh, uh, fees for for that as well. Okay, but now under the Madrid system, okay, and what we can do under MyPo now is you file one application to MyPo. Okay, MyPo will then forward it to WIPO, and WIPO will then distribute it to the relevant offices across the world, okay? So um, this was, the Madrid system was only enforced in Malaysia uh, end of last year as well. And uh, according to MIPO, they have since received thousands of applications uh, and Malaysia was the 106th uh, member of this system. And the good news is that if you're planning to expand your business here in Southeast Asia, um, all the Southeast Asian countries are under this Madrid system except Myanmar. Okay, so that really opens up your option uh, to expand overseas, okay? So to be eligible, you citizen of Malaysia, domicile of Malaysia, body corporation, uh, you must already either have a mark, either pending registration or registered in Malaysia first. So Malaysia will be considered the office or of origin. So if you see this diagram, Malaysia is the office of origin under MIPO basically, okay? So the benefits of the um, Madrid system, this is very... Um, beneficial to SMEs. They stand to benefit the most because in the traditional manner, if you mentioned, you saw just now, you file one application to all four countries. Usually the bigger the bigger brands, the, the McDonald's, the KFCs, the Subways will have the deep pockets to, to do that kind of registration across the board. Uh, 
Um, but now SMEs uh, can take uh, 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 take a uh, use of this uh, Madrid system. It's very convenient, okay? Rather than have four representatives, four filing fees, uh, four translations, you now only need to deal with one process in one language. And better still, when you get your registration done, you only need to remember one renewal date instead of four renewal dates, okay? So saves time, saves money. Um, there is even a time limit for each country to respond, 12 to 18 months. Uh, and when you get your uh, registration, it has the same legal effect in all the countries uh, that you've registered in, basically. Okay, my last bit. Um, I Some people don't see the importance of registering a trademark, okay? But uh, registering a trademark has many advantages, okay? The first one, most important, it gives you exclusivity, a right to assign, license, and franchise your mark. Okay. And from there, you'll be able to generate uh, commercial value uh, and gains, basically. So um, the more you grow your brand, okay, the more satisfied customers that you have, the more your asset becomes valuable, basically. Okay? And through that, you're also building your goodwill and reputation. You see the Apple logo, you know what it stands for. Uh, you see uh, McDonald's. Okay, I know I'm using McDonald's a lot because it's my one of my favorite food. You see McDonald's, you know what kind of food you're going to get. If you travel overseas, you don't know what to eat, you don't want to eat the roadside store, the safest one, look for the yellow sign and you know what kind of food you're going to get. Doesn't matter which country in the world you go to. Okay, product identification, you recognize the product quality I mentioned just now. Okay, you can use the R symbol with your, um, with your, with your, with your uh, logo. Okay, again, your protection is for 10 years. That is an investment worth considering go through the process, and then you're set for 10 years. Basically, you don't have to think about it uh, until 10 years' time. Uh, you are creating an asset, intangible, but an asset uh, nonetheless. Uh, and then with this right as an owner, if someone attempts to come in and use your brand, you can basically um, uh, go after them for infringement. Basically, they are breaching your intellectual property rights. Okay, uh, so when we talk about valuable, I just wanted to share, Amazon in uh, 2020 stands as the most valuable, <clears throat> most valuable brand in the world. We're talking about 220 million. You can see the, the, the next uh, brands on the list, Google, Apple, Microsoft, a lot of tech companies I know, okay? Uh, and of course, let's bring it back home. Most valuable brand in Malaysia is Petronas, followed by Maybank, Genting, Saim Dhabi, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, um, so I, deal with IP uh, a lot uh, with my sports clients, actually, um, because we are, we, we, what we do is we deal with image rights, uh, especially like say for, for athletes. Um, so, you know, how, how can they protect their image and, and prevent from abuse? And what you see at the bottom is all these top class uh, or world-class athletes that have created their own mark and their own logo. So at the bottom, you'll see RF stands for Roger Federer, next to it, Tiger Woods, CR7, Cristiano Ronaldo. And the last one, I'm not sure how many recognize, that's actually LeBron James' uh, personal uh, logo, okay? The top is the most valuable sporting brands, uh, familiar ones, you see Nike, Adidas there. And the middle ones are actually the most valuable sporting events uh, in the world. Okay, surprisingly, I know you know you see the Olympics is not number one. It's actually the Super Bowl in America. Okay, again, back to home, home ground. Uh, Teapot is a creamer, very commonly used, just to show you how FNN has grown this brand over the years. And when they sold it uh, a couple of years ago, it was worth 83.17 million. Okay, um, this is my poll encouraging you to register your trademark. Uh, also, Maipo trying to uh, explain to you um, the differences between unregistered and registered trademark. Okay, and this is my last effort to convince you on why it's important to register um, a trademark. Okay, I'm gonna end in about two minutes. Um, bear with me. Okay, so on Netflix, there is a documentary on Donald Trump, uh, President Donald Trump. Um, it's called Trump, uh, an American Dream. It's a four-part series. Uh, and it speaks about his, you know, his, his early days and how he got involved in politics. So in the last episode, the fourth episode, right towards the end, okay, um, it's, it's 2012, the year 2012, and uh, 
it was just announced the presidential election results. And it was announced that Obama had beaten uh, Mitt Romney, uh, the Republican. And if you watch the, 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 the series, basically, Trump has been flirting with the idea of, of running for president of the United States for a few times already. Okay? And at this day, I think it was um, November 2012, and it was announced that Obama had won. And right after that announcement, Trump instructed his lawyers to go to the trademark office and trademark this phrase, make America great again, which went on to become his main uh, you know, campaign slogan uh, for his presidential campaign that led to him uh, winning uh, the 2016 presidential election. So four years, even before he announced that he's running for president, in 2012, he turned around and he told his lawyers, go trademark this phrase, make America great again. So don't get me wrong, this is not about politics. I'm not a big fan of Trump. I uh, won't go into that. But I just want to demonstrate to you that if the current president of the free world can see the importance of trademarking a phrase like this, I hope that will convince you on how important it is to, to trademark your mark. Okay, so um, again, MIPO encouraging us to uh, register your intellectual property. Okay, and uh, my last four points, uh, IP is really important to continue to promote creativity and innovation of our, our human minds. Uh, and through that, when we grow our brands, this will uh, generate competition, generate jobs. It will be of great value. I've tried to demonstrate it through the numbers just now. Uh, and it's very important to find the right intellectual property protection for your business. Um, okay, that's all from me. Um, I'm going to pass the time back to Hannah. Thank you very much. I know I've, I've run a little bit over time. Thank you for bearing with me. Uh, Hannah, I'll just pass it back to you. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, everybody, um, they will, there are a lot of questions actually, but I will pick up uh, the most uh, relevant ones. Um, just give me a moment while I um, share the slide. Um, I see that there is a raised hand by Intan. Um, would you be comfortable taking um, questions over Zoom, uh, Leslie? No problem. As long as you can spare the time, I will do the same. Okay. Uh, Intan, could you unmute yourself and, and go ahead and ask your question? All right. We have a question, well, a few here, uh, which I've highlighted. Um, number one is from Lydia. This is quite highly requested. There are two likes there. <laughs> if I write something, for example, a content or a syllabus, but I work at an and at an organization on a part-time basis, can I charge the copyright to the center? Um, okay, I think um, when I look at this question, I think the first thing I, I, I hope to understand is uh, what exactly do you mean by charge uh, the copyright to the center? Um, so I'll just maybe address this in general. Uh, Lydia, if you're, if you're here, you can type in the comment box what exactly you mean by charge, but um, when we talk about copyright or IP, uh, most, mostly what we want to do is determine who is the owner of the IP, okay? Uh, so in this instance, I guess then the question would then be, uh, are, you the, are you the owner uh, of the content or the syllabus or whatever you have written, or is it your organization, okay? Um, so what, what then we will have to look at is what exactly is the terms of your employment uh, with the organization? So um, Again, go back to your employment contract. Uh, there might be something written in there uh, that says that if you are doing this, uh, you know, during the time that you're supposed to be spent working for the organization, then there is a possibility it might actually belong to the organization. Uh, but if it's something that you can prove that it's uh, you've worked on, you know, it's your own project, nothing to do with the organization, uh, then maybe we can argue that it belongs to you. Okay, I see your statement here, Mama. How can we make money from the content created if it is not listed in the contract? Okay, um, that's, that's really uh, depends on your business or your organization's business model. Um, the way to make money is usually by licensing it out uh, to, to third parties. So if your content is, is really good, so say uh, you, you've written a, an article uh, and you want to... Uh, allow someone else to publish it on, on their website, their platform, uh, and then you charge them a small fee for it. That's, that's one example of, of basically commercializing it. 
Yeah, I hope I answered your question, Lydia. Thanks, Leslie. Um, I would actually skip to the next question by Lydia since from the same person. Um, she's asking, how about an article I wrote for, for social media, via social media, is the copyright automatic? Okay, social media is really tricky. Okay, so um, I don't know how many people realize uh, when you post things on social media, I'm not going to name, name any particular platform, so I'm just going to speak generally because I don't want to get sued by any um, <laughs> social media companies. Um, I, I don't know how many people realize that when you register for an account um, in, uh, on social media, you probably would have clicked that you accept some terms and conditions of use. Uh, and there is a very high possibility that uh, in that terms and conditions of use, there might be a, a statement that says that anything that you post on that platform belongs to that platform. Okay, so although it was written by you, um, it doesn't stop the platform from having maybe either joint ownership over it. Uh, it might even give them rights to republish it somewhere else, use it however they want. So very often when we click accept, um, we're actually accepting a whole bunch of terms and conditions that we don't even realize. Uh, we do that very often with our, um, when we create new email boxes, actually. Thank you. So beware when you click your agree button. Yep. Get the message here. <laughs> okay. Okay. Next, we will go to David's question. Are we required to get the approval from a client if we require to show their logo on a PowerPoint presentation? Or I, I will just extend this question to um, if we are to show someone else, a third party, a logo belonging to another person, what is these steps? Or do we need to get approval from the owners of these uh, logos? Sorry, Hannah, I just lost you for a bit. Could you just repeat your sentence? Oh, I said, if we needed to show a logo or something to a third person mm. um, for, for something that belongs to another person, what sort of approval do we need to get um, what are the steps that you would encourage us to take? I think it really depends on the purpose. Um, so if I, because I feel that um, David's question is, he says, do we need to get formal approval from client if you want to show mm. their logo? So if that party is already your client, I'm assuming you have some form of a, a legal relationship with them. So it may, it may be expressed or implied that you have that approval to uh, go out and do work for them. But if you want to be safe, then this applies to Hannah's question as well. Just get an approval in writing. Just say, I need to uh, use your logo for this, this, this purpose. Uh, uh, if the other party is agreeable, you know, the original owner is uh, agreeable, make sure they reply to you in writing as well. So you have black and white proof and not just, ah, okay, can, can. Yeah. Yes, yes. I think um, a follow-up to that answer would be if some, even if it was a, a telephone that call that says, oh yeah, I agree, uh, you would usually send a, an email to confirm or anything in writing rather uh, to confirm that sort of uh, conversation that has happened. It's just to cover all bases. Uh, Fully agree. Case. Fully agree, yeah, Anna. Thank definitely. you. We'll never know. Okay, we'll go to Simon's question. It's a two-part question. Uh, let me see, I cannot actually read this. Hi, Simon. Oh, hi, Leslie, sorry. Hi, Leslie. If my PO is now a commercial entity instead of a government regulatory agency, how would my PO actually help us in reality when there's a violation? Commercial, I, I wouldn't say it's a commercial entity. Um, it's, it's still, in some sense, a, a government uh, agency and I believe it's now a statutory body if, if I'm not mistaken it's now a statutory body in terms of its creation so when I say corporatized I didn't mean uh, I didn't mean privatized I didn't mean that it's a private body per se uh, and and the history uh, that I put in my slides is was actually taken from uh, my post website itself because I didn't want to make sure I, I get it right um, so then comes your second half of your question uh, how can MIPO actually help us in reality when there's a violation? So MIPO doesn't exactly come into the picture when there's an infringement. Um, 
a few other parties do. So first of all, we need to uh, go back to the act to see what exactly is the infringement. Okay, so, so sometimes when we're dealing with uh, counterfeit items or piracy items, we may actually go to the uh, Ministry of um, Consumer uh, and there's an officer there and that we can all deal with to go and uh, do the uh, seizure. You know, you go there and, and seize the counterfeit goods. Okay. Alternatively, uh, look for a lawyer, uh, consider filing an infringement suit because in our courts, we have a, a division that's specially for intellectual property, actually. Uh, the, the judge there is um, specialized and, and uh, knowledgeable uh, in IP disputes. All right, thank you. Um, I'll go to the second part of Simon's question. What is Malaysia's track record in actually protecting IP holders? Cases that actually went to court and resulted in wins for IP holders. Um, it, it varies on a it varies on a case to case basis. Uh, uh, and Hannah, I'm going to pull in a point that you and I spoke about yesterday. So it, okay, this varies on a case to case basis. So what might even happen is you are an IP holder. And uh, there are even cases in court where you go against someone who has been using a brand for many, many years, but didn't register. And so you have an unregistered mark versus another unregistered mark or registered, unregistered versus registered, etc. Okay, so you have all these different scenarios that, that might come out in court. So I'm going to tie that back to the advantages and importance of registering. So if you register due process, you have your certificate in hand, that certificate is almost sort of like uh, conclusive of your ownership of the IP. As compared to if you don't register, but you say that you've been using it since 1985, okay, what you're going to have to do in court then is to dig out all this evidence to show that you've been using this brand since 1985. You're going to dig out your, uh, your company incorporation. You're going to dig up your news report that uh, you know, show that you first created, you opened your first branch in 1985. You know, you're gonna dig up all these things. And so you have all these lists uh, of evidence for the unregistered mark versus the guy who registered, all he needs to do is just hold his certificate of registration. So, um, I mean, in general, that's my answer, but uh, basically it, it will vary on a case-to-case -case basis. The judge will actually analyze the, the facts of each case. Yes, yeah, Simon, maybe to also add to the answer, um, it's really not about the track record here. The Malaysian law, they, they look at what you have to present to them, right? So if you have something as concrete as a registration, um, that, that would almost uh, guarantee you a good case. Um, and uh, if you don't, you know, if everything is left to evidence, then, you know, evidence might be lost. It's, it's really dependent on the weight of your evidence. Um, so that is something, that's a point that you would want to uh, think of as well when, you know, when you take a matter to court. Okay, two more questions. Are we good, Ken? We're okay, Hannah. Uh, we'll take these two questions on Slido. Uh, and mm. Nidia and Shermaine, uh, I see your questions on the comment box. But if it's okay, we'll deal with the Slido questions first and then we'll look at your questions. Got it, got it, Ken. If an employee manages to create an idea with the current company and he or she left, use the idea to a new company, can the former company sue the employee? It probably ties back to the old, the, the, the earlier question you had. So well, what she's saying, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Tana. Sorry, didn't mean to cut you. No, I was, I mean, did you understand the question or? Uh, my answer will be actually very similar to what I answered uh, earlier yes, about yes. The, the lady who drafted something for the organization on a part-time basis. You have to go back and look at your um, employment contract, see what are the um, uh, terms and conditions uh, in the employment contract. And chances are there'll be a clause to say that whatever uh, work that you've done or created during the course of your employment uh, cannot be used and, and taken for your new company, etc. Uh, so potentially the former uh, company can potentially sue the employee, potentially possible. Yeah, thank you for that. And final question, this would be uh, probably <laughs> be about passing off, which you did not touch, but uh, it's probably a good time to just probably touch a little bit on it. In the past, there's a fast food audit KLC looking similar to KFC. 
was it in violation of the law due to the logo being uh, the same color? Yeah, I, I must admit, despite my love for fast food, I've not heard of KLC before. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've not heard, so I can't imagine what KLC logo looks like. I will, I promise I will, I will search it after this. Um, so if it's really similar, uh, if you if we go back just now, remember my uh, the flow chart for the registration process. Um, when um, the uh, your your application is being published in the in the journal for public, so what KFC will need to do is KFC will need to be vigilant and every time look for the new publications and basically see whether there are any marks that are similar to theirs and then decide whether they want to file an opposition proceeding or not. Basically, yeah. okay. Or, uh, but that's quite late in the process. In the earlier part of the process, when the uh, MIPO does the examination, there is a possibility MIPO might even uh, give a provisional refusal on the basis that it's uh, deceivingly similar. Potential. Yeah. Yep, got it, got it. Uh, I will stop sharing the screen for the Slido and we'll go to the questions in the chat. Can someone use a logo which is visually different from my registered logo, but pronounced the same as mine in its entirety or in part? My logo, my logo's main feature is the word. Um, so again, that might go back to that uh, the part of my slides where I say it's. Uh, let me just make sure I get the term right. Huh? Just give me a second. Get that right and show you again. So what is not registrable? I'm just going to share this screen so that you can see it. So the first one, likely to deceive or cause confusion to the public. So uh, again, um, if it is pronounced the same entirely or in part, it could fall uh, within this uh, category likely to deceive or cause confusion to the public because um, you wouldn't know whether it's the same product or same services uh, without looking at the spelling because you're saying it sounds the same. Uh, yeah, so again, uh, like what I mentioned to I think the other gentleman earlier can either be uh, knocked off or provisional refusal during the examination stage or uh, it can come into play during the opposition proceedings later on. Okay. Um, I would actually like to go to Eric's question before Lydia, if that's okay. It says here, can we patent a COVID-19 treatment? Wow. Um, um, I remember there was a mention in the slide about treatment of the human body. What do you have to yeah. say about that? Um, first of all, if you have a treatment, I hope you're sharing it with the Ministry of Health. Um, <laughs> um, it, it, it really depends uh, on, uh, it's a little bit technical because when we talk about invention, uh, there's usually a technical aspect involved. Uh, so again, it's probably examined on a, on a case to case basis. So when you say treatment, uh, what sort of treatment exactly are you referring to? Is it a treatment um, when someone already has COVID-19 and you are delaying the process to their, to their, to their passing or is it a vaccine in terms of uh, you know preventing COVID-19 altogether so really really has to be uh, analyzed uh, one by one to see if it falls within uh, the requirements of a patent protection actually. Mm. Yeah so the answer here Eric is to really um, zoom in on the question COVID-19 treatment what exactly do you mean do you mean a vaccine do you mean a medicine do you mean a path, you know, a path, a, a series of treatments. Uh, these are things we can discuss um, later. Um, and this will be the final question from Lydia. Do we need to renew or apply copyright after 50 years? And how much does it cost for registering a trademark? Um, I think the 50 years is... Uh meant to commensurate with the lifetime uh, of the author or a reasonable amount of time thereafter. Um, I suppose you can apply after 50 years. Then. 
the, the, the thing is copyright is an automatic protection. Uh, so if you really want to do something after 50 years, just send in uh, a new voluntary notification. Um, that being said, I can't promise that the process will still be the same in 50 years time. Um, so it's, it's a little bit difficult to answer because I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow actually. And probably a good segue about cost. Uh, okay. What's the cost? Uh, very common question. Thank you, Lydia. Um, so previously, under the old Trademarks Act, the, um, the cost to register a trademark purely on, on, on filing fees are nothing to do with our professional fees, just, you know, the filing fees um, and the publication fee for the, for the journal. I think it's about 950 thereabouts. Uh, but the way the fee structure is such that uh, last time it used to be... Um, Application fee is one, publication fee is one, etc. But now under the new Trademarks Act, uh, apparently they've come up with a new structure where they've tried to combine all the fees together. Uh, and then if you have multiple applications, uh, there's also another fee involved. So there's a new, different fee structure under the um, uh, under the new Act, basically. Malaysian ringgit. Malaysian ringgit. Malaysian ringgit. <laughs> uh, RM nine hundred fifty. Okay. Um. I see a raised hand from Nurvel. Oh, I'm sorry, I really oh, yes. don't know how to pronounce uh, that name. Yeah, no, um, it's one of my sports clients, actually. Ah, right, right, right. Okay. Um, last question, if that's okay. Uh, we do have to run after yes. this question. Could you unmute yourself, please? Could you unmute yourself? Sorry, uh, can't hear you, Dato. You have to unmute yourself first. Hi, Leslie. Hi, Hannah. Uh, Hi. Okay, very, very good question. Uh, because I, close my, I just closed my uh, travel company. Mm. So now I'm venturing into health and beauty, correct? So um, my new company is called NBF Health and Beauty. So uh, we are really, really new, but we have a lot of ideas. So uh, eventually we might want to come up with our own brand. So, because we are new, should we uh, patent our uh, uh, logo or uh, because we, as it is now, we don't have a product, but we have a few in line. And yes, because of, uh, you know, now with PKB, PKPB, uh, we cannot, uh, you know, uh, proceed with that right now. Uh, but we have a few products in line, which we want to put uh, our logo on it. But should we then... Uh, you know, uh, patent our logo now uh, because there's no there's no uh, uh, product yet. Yeah, Ken, Ado, actually we're talking about two different parts, two different types of protection. So first one would actually be to trademark your logo, which is something you can even consider doing now. Um, I'll be happy to sit down with you through the conceptualization process. We can go through the whole thing together. So you may you can come up with your um, a, a logo for your brand first. And then that, that brand, you can go and stick it on all your different products. So that's the first one in terms of your brand. Then your second one is in terms of your, uh, your products. If any of it is uh, uh, original or new uh, inventions that you know, maybe you all have created yourself, then we can maybe look into um, potential patent application provided it fulfills the requirements uh, under the Act. Oh, okay, great. Uh, I will PM you to P. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. And on that note, I think um, I will not take any more questions, but don't worry. You know, you can always contact us. Um, don't feel like this is a lost opportunity to contact us. We are uh, quite reachable in diff from different avenues. Let me just share the screen um, to, to share with you something just before we end. We have an upcoming talk on adopting children in Malaysia next on the 4th of November, 2020. So if you know someone who, uh, who are looking to adopt children, or if you yourselves are looking into it, uh, please do sign up. Um, Jasmine and Eric are both very experienced uh, in this process. Um, you can sign up uh, via the link provided there or scan the QR code. I'll just leave the um, uh, screen for a bit if you want to. Uh, scan it. Okay. All right. Uh, next. Um, please also, um, I, I believe the chat will have our 
feedback form. So if you like our talk, if you would ha you have any suggestions uh, for us to improve, or if you have any topics which you would like us to cover for our future talks, please leave um, um, a comment in our feedback form. The link should be up in the chat box at the moment. Right, and then, um, like I said, we're reachable via social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and um, uh, Instagram. Uh, well, you didn't mention it earlier, uh, but I can, <laughs> uh, Leslie. So um, you can just type Mawing Gwai and Associates and you should be able to access all these accounts. Uh, you can you know, ask your questions. Otherwise, you could also come to us for a complimentary consultation. It's a 30 minute uh, video consultation. Um, now with um, technology, we're able to do it online. You, know, you don't have to come over to the office. Um, you can schedule it via our website or scan this QR once again. And uh, yeah, that's about it. I am done. Oops. Um, so just Thank a, you, everybody. Uh, just a quick note, Eric. I saw that you mentioned that uh, possible cure, what did you say? Possible vaccine or cure for the COVID-19 one. I, I wish you the best of luck. Uh, do let us know if you need any assistance with that. And um, I just want to say thank you very much, everyone, for your afternoon. I know I've totally overrun the time, uh, but I appreciate you taking the time to attend the talk. Mm -hmm.